Uh, our next uh, segment is going to talk, you're going to hear from uh, key thought leaders, uh, and we've assembled an amazing panel to talk about uh, their vision of education and where they see uh, opportunities for awesomeness existing in our state. Uh, here to introduce that panel is Leslie Walden. She is Vice President of Public Affairs for the North Carolina Region for Fidelity Investments and also a member of the North Carolina Chamber Board. Leslie, welcome and thank you. onto our campus on externships. We're doing job shadow with students so that they can all come and see that, you know, learning to code isn't just how you get a job these days. You need the critical thinking. You need the problem solving. You need the collaboration. So we're doing all of that. And when we think about a company like Fidelity, you might think of uh, mutual funds or 401ks. But whether you define STEM by the traditional definition, or as Dr. Houston defined it, you know, we're looking at technologists, we're looking at customer service representatives here in North Carolina. So we've got STEM covered, and we want to share that with uh, the education community. So how can we be doing more, as Dr. Howes said? I think this panel might help us, because they're going to share with us where education is going and where we need to be a part of it. I have to tell you that my script for introducing these people uh, is in highlighted in blue, so I need to take my glasses off as I talk and read carefully. I will ask you to hold your applause as I uh, introduce this esteemed panel. First, Dr. June Atkinson, State Superintendent of the Public Schools of North Carolina at the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. If you'd like to join us at the, at the stage. Dr. James Williamson, President of the North Carolina Community College System. Peter Hahn, Senior Advisor for the University of North Carolina System. And joining us today to moderate this esteemed panel is Susan Gates, Special Advisor on Education with the SAS Institute. Thank you, Susan, for moderating. And thank you, panelists, for being part of this conversation. We're really excited to hear what you have to say. So please join me in welcoming the panel. say, isn't Randy Woodson great? I mean, he is a phenomenal <laughs> We are so fortunate to have him at NC State. And believe me, uh, Florida, Ohio State, you go down the list, they've been after him for years. We're working to keep him. We're going to keep him here. Uh, no matter what, I promise you that. Uh, the question about STEM is a great one. We've got a lot of work underway. Uh, to redesign STEM courses, uh, particularly those early stage gatekeeper classes that are prerequisites to science and math majors. And if you're like me, maybe struggled a little bit with science and math, we find a lot of 
our students uh, find those courses challenging and they often move into other uh, pathways. But supported by individual campus departments, uh, with UNC system workshops, federal grants, we're changing the way we teach those classes so that we can make them more of a gateway to STEM majors rather than a gatekeeper. Uh, we're also working on uh, transparency about career outcomes for different programs and majors so students have a clear understanding of what they can expect from those pathways and see the demand for STEM majors. Uh, also, this is beyond our scope, but we find it particularly important that the possibility of international students with advanced STEM degrees uh, should have an expedited path to an employer-sponsored visa to stay in the country because so often they go on to start new businesses and contribute to the community in a very positive way. Thank you, Peter. Um, Jimmy, let me move to you and we've been hearing a lot about business and collaborating with the education system. How Focusing on the, the local community colleges around the state, how can businesses become more involved with their community college to help students develop the skills that are actually in demand across the state that we've also been hearing about? Well, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here today, and it's a delight to be in North Carolina. Um, I, um, th th there are a myriad of ways that, that you can help us, um, and we can help you. Um, the chief among those is that each of our 58 colleges and all of the degree programs that we offer have advisory committees. And those advisory committees really are dependent upon uh, the customer. And you are the customer uh, as the business or industry leader. And so if you are asked to serve on an advisory committee, certainly uh, take that opportunity. It gives you an opportunity to truly influence the curriculum. Uh, if there's something that is not occurring that you think that you need, that's your opportunity to really hone in and, and try to make some changes. The second way is to give us feedback about our graduates. What are we doing well? What, are we, what do we need to improve? We're always eager to hear uh, whether we've hit the mark or whether we need to recalibrate and find out where we go from, from there. Um, so constant feedback about how our graduates are performing is very, very important. And Pam mentioned something that is of, of super uh, paramount importance, and that is providing opportunities for internships, co-ops, apprenticeships, all of those work-based learning um, opportunities. We need more of those. Our students need more of those. And so if you will find it with, within your structure to offer something like that, uh, we certainly, certainly would appreciate it. Um, and then finally, I guess as a, as a selfish pitch, I have to say that um, you could support your local college's foundation. Uh, that foundation is very important, being able to fund things that are either unfunded by the state or underfunded by the state. New, creative, innovative things that might fall out of the, the realm of what traditionally would be funded. So those are just a few of them. Thank you, Jimmy. And Jim, let me turn to you with a similar question. Um, how is DPI working to bring together the business and education communities so that students really are ready to succeed in college or career to path issues? Uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the opportunity to be on this panel. The philosophy in the Department of Public Instruction is that there is always a chair at the table for business and industry. We need people from business and industry to be at the table as we move forward with our career pathway initiative, as we move to, uh, forward with warning all of our students graduating from our schools to have some type of work-based experience. Uh, we also believe that it's critical to stand with and join hands with business and industry to support higher standards and I'm very grateful to the business community for helping uh, that uh, continue to be a reality in North Carolina. Uh, also, we have joined hands with business and industry for an initiative called Students at Work. Uh, that is very important as we look at our students at the middle school level having exposure to what it means to go to work each day and what are some of the careers available. And although very small, it's really important to grow teachers at work. For teachers across North Carolina during the summer, 
have an opportunity to be in your businesses. And one of the out, uh, an outgrowth of that initiative is that if, if our teachers are in your businesses learning during the summer, then they take that learning and turn it in to lesson plans which we can share throughout North Carolina through our technology infrastructure called Home Base. Uh, we also have a philosophy that you are our clients, you are our customers, and therefore we depend on you to give us advice about what students should know to be able to do. Uh, we have gone from 25,000 credentials, and Joanne may have mentioned this, 25,000 credentials seven years ago, to over 130,000 credentials. We know that there are lots of business and industry credentials and we need feedback from you as business people to let us know the most critical credentials so that we can place an emphasis on those credentials in all of our schools. Uh, we also depend on you to be our thought partners. Uh, I know uh, many of you in this room are, are very willing to give us ideas to help us as we move forward in that being a partner, partner in helping us to design systems uh, is a really critical component of our work with business and industry. Our big goal is we, don't want, we want all of our students to graduate and we want all of our students to have some level of work experience. In other words, we don't want our students to leave our schools without some type of work experience. And we've got a long way to go to get to that when you think about 100,000 students graduating each year. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Peter, let me switch gears a little bit here and talk about what North Carolina Lake New States is experiencing, which is a teacher shortage. And um, what would you recommend uh, that the education system do, particularly the UNC system and the business community, to get more students interested in, in entering the teaching profession? Sure. Student enrollment in our teacher preparation programs has declined uh, rather precipitously uh, in recent years, and some of that can be explained away, of course, by the decision to uh, alter the compensation for advanced degrees. Uh, but it's it's a significant challenge. Now, we've got 15 schools of education with over uh, 100 teacher preparation and alternative licensure options available. And the key goal for us, of course, uh, is to produce great teachers for the state to improve education and outcomes for, for all of us. I mean, it's a virtuous cycle in that sense. Uh, so we're consciously recruiting uh, to fill the pipeline from high school juniors and seniors, uh, mid-career professionals, uh, community college transfers, uh, undecided majors at UNC system schools, uh, high school counselors, military personnel uh, and their spouses, and uh, especially for uh, high need areas in particular. But it's a challenge. Now this is something that's very near and dear to President Spelman's heart. Uh, and I, I'm uh, filling in for her today. She had a long-standing commitment. But please notice about her. She's very much a, an education reformer. Secretary of Education poured her heart into K-12. I think this will be a major emphasis of hers going forward, working with our, our partners in the public schools and community colleges. Uh, you'll hear more from her soon on uh, related issues such as how our education schools can be uh, laboratories for best teaching practices, how there can be more transparency in the quality of our graduates, uh, and utilizing innovations such as uh, clinical teaching which marry uh, practical experience with content mastery. And the business community, of course, will be a key partner uh, in, in all of these efforts. Uh, we're so grateful to the Chamber and all the members of the business community that support the university system in so many ways. The mentoring opportunities, the internships, uh, the research partnerships, all of this uh, works together to address these crucial issues. Peter, let me, get, let me go back to you, Juno, on that, because Peter mentioned changes to what some might have seen as incentives um, to 
getting students interested in going into the teaching profession. So I'd like to ask you what your opinion is of the budget uh, that was passed uh, by the General Assembly as it impacts K-12, and what your vision is for how to build on that budget for getting more students interested in teaching. Uh, to give you a context of my thinking about uh, public education teachers, I believe that we need a comprehensive teacher compensation system that would be similar to a wedding cake. And the first layer of that wedding cake would be to have competitive salaries for all of our teachers. And I've just heard on the way over here today that a national study has shown that our teachers, including benefits, are about 11% behind other professions for which uh, you would need the same degree of preparation. But you start with that foundational layer on the wedding cake. And then the second layer would be to pay teachers extra for teacher leadership, mentoring, uh, whatever is a need at a local school district, such as a, an instructional coach, and the list goes on. And then the third layer of that cake would be extra compensation for teachers who will go in teams to schools that are struggling and need additional support. Uh, when we look at what the General Assembly did this time, they have taken steps toward that waiting cake approach. Uh, teachers did get additional salary increases. Uh, as you may expect me to say, not enough, but progress has been made. And then when you look at the second layer of that cake, the General Assembly has put in place funding for uh, at least 10 school districts to give extra pay for extra work, for leadership, for reshuffling uh, responsibilities so that there, some teachers would be paid more. So one positive thing about the General Assembly's action this time has been to start on the way of having a wedding cake approach to have a comprehensive approach to, uh, to funding our teachers or salaries. Uh, we also see that something that that is different in the budget is that some responsibilities that have traditionally been a part of the university system have been transferred to the State Board of Education. And some of the responsibilities traditionally given to the State Board of Education have now been transferred to the university system. So it'll be interesting to see how that works as we move forward. Another plus for the budget, and I believe this is extremely important for us to have technology as a friend and to have technology integral to our work, and that is the $4.7 million appropriated as a part of the digital learning plan. I bring that up because we know that teachers need tools they need to feel support, and the technology plan is one way to help move toward giving teachers the tools they need. Um, I'm appreciative that the General Assembly gave dollars for instructional materials and supplies, about $30 per student. We had gone through a time when we did hardly had any money in that category, and we need to continue to work when we get back to the place before the uh, recession of $60 per student. So I bring that up because all of these work together to show teachers that we value and respect them. And one way that we can get more people into the field is to have competitive salaries and to show by giving them the tools and the support that we value and respect what they do for each child every day. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Jim, let me talk to you about the education continuum, uh, which at least we at SAS see starting in early learning and continue all the way through everything here. Uh, how do you envision the community college system coordinating with P12 um, and the university systems to develop the talent pipeline that business actually needs to have? Well, it certainly is a continuum, and, and that's the important piece, I think, to recognize Certainly career pathways are uh, integral to our strategic plan. And, and the crux of a career pathway basically is for a student to be able to ramp on and off as, as life dictates. Uh, I have a 28-year-old son who is, is ramping back onto that pathway 
uh, back onto that, um, that, that learning highway because he realizes that his earning potential is not exactly where it needs to be. And so I think that by giving um, students that opportunity to not lose what they have already done, uh, but to build on that, and, and of course it begins, as you say, in the high school and, and, and really through, if they, if they come the route of community colleges, and then ultimately onto the university system. So, so career pathways are truly uh, integral to uh, forming success. We're really trying hard in North Carolina to grow a world-class uh, workforce, and this is one way that we can do that. Additionally, the, the college and career promise is an opportunity to uh, allow students um, to benefit from college level courses while they're still enrolled in the, uh, in the P-12 system, the, the, the high school system. And our revamped um, comprehensive articulation agreements, masterminded by my good friend here uh, from the UMC system, uh, really does solidify uh, some of those pathways and, and some of making that, that, that transfer seamless and making that, um, that really um, uh, comprehensive approach to higher education work. And those, those pathways are, and those comprehensive articulation agreements, all of those things are critical uh, for us to build a work, world-class uh, workforce. Thank you. Um, Jim, we know that our graduation rates have continued to rise here, which is fantastic news. But how will really our students prepare when they leave your, your doors and head out for college level coursework in math or reading, whether that's in the UNC system or the community college system? And is there anything that business can do to help them get more prepared and more comfortable? Uh, one, there are several indicators to determine how well our students are prepared for college and careers. One is the remediation rate at our university system. And the last time we had data from the university system of the students who entered uh, our 15, or 17, uh, it has dropped to a little under 5%. And in 2010, it was 10%. So we've gone from 10% and cut it in half as far as the mediation rate at the university system. And then when you look at the community colleges, uh, we have about 94,000 students who graduate. We have about 18,000 who enter the community college system right out of high school. And we have gone from a remediation rate uh, of about 46% uh, to this last time of about 22%. So we cut in half the remediation rate at the community college level. And I have to give lots of praise to the community college system because the community college system did a very extensive research study and found out that what were the key indicators to predict whether students needed to go to developmental courses. So they made some changes in policy. We've also cut in half the remediation rate for students uh, in reading and it is now in the 20% range where it was in the 46, 47% range. So we're making progress. Our big goal is to have a big fat zero uh, as, the, as the remediation rate in North Carolina. So there are two indicators. Another indicator is that of the graduating class of 2015, 35% of the graduating class had college credit. They earn that college credit through advanced placement courses or with articulated courses with the community college. So when you think 35% had college credit, that's assurance to us that they are able to do college work while still in high school. And all of these factors are really important uh, in addition to our students earning 130,000 credentials. Uh, that shows that these students can compete with others who are going to the job market in those areas for which credentialing is important. But, uh, but we have made great progress. 86% uh, graduation rate is great, but we've got to get to nearly 100% and we need to get to zero. And there are initiatives underway which have been put into law 
that we will work very closely with the community college system of community college, as we have for a long, long time, to address mathematics in, uh, as the way we prepare students uh, going into the 12th grade. And I believe that that will yield great results also. Thank you. Um, Peter, let me come back to you. We've heard a lot of talk about STEM or whatever iteration folks are talking about with that. But I wanted to broaden it beyond that to all skill levels that are needed, including the soft skills of communication, collaboration, and critical thinking. Um, how can the business community help the UNC system to help students develop all the entire broad range of skills, not just the hard skills that are necessary to be successful in the business world? Susan, as I mentioned earlier, the partnerships with the business community are just so crucial for us. I mean, and it's beyond uh, expressing support with your wallets, although that's always welcomed. Uh, but I ask that you give up your experience and your expertise because that's invaluable. Help us understand your needs uh, and how we can be a more effective partner as well. Work alongside of us to offer those internships, the mentoring opportunities, the career guidance to students who, who need and want that real world experience. All the employers I talk to, uh, feedback I receive is if they have some of that experience, uh, they're all the more valuable uh, in the workforce, for sure. But also, please call on our faculty for research partnerships and take advantage of our state-of-the-art labs, uh, facilities that your tax dollars and philanthropy help to build. Uh, hold us accountable uh, as we focus first and foremost on broadening the opportunities for student access. Uh, and uh, I think uh, the, the formal and informal partnerships between our system and the business community that you heard Randy talk about so, uh, so well this morning, that's just crucial to the, our future, but more importantly to the students that we're educating. Thank you. Uh, Jimmy, let me come back to you and put you on the spot a little bit. Um, I know you've only been on board since July. Right. Um, and that you've been doing a lot of touring around the state. But based upon what you've seen so far, what is your vision for the future of the community college system here in North Carolina? Well, thank you. It's, it, it has been a whirlwind. I mean, you can imagine coming from a state with 46 counties to one with 100 counties, uh, 16 colleges as opposed to 58. It's sort of like drinking from a fire hose. Um, it is all, for 53 uh, years or more, we have um, been needing, hopefully been needing the needs of business and industry uh, in the state of North Carolina. And I really don't see that changing. But we can always improve on, on uh, what we're providing in terms of our, um, our outcomes and, and the product that we're placing uh, out in the, uh, in the workforce. You know, for me, it's important to build relationships, and it's important for me to have relationships statewide, so that so that when I when I when we hit a bump, that we can can call on you as a business partner or as a chamber member, um, or someone from K-12, DPI, or, or from the uh, university system. Um, it's important for us to have those partnerships uh, throughout the state, and so I am really working very closely with our presidents and with our board of trustees uh, to establish those relationships. It's important for me to understand and know who the legislators are. Um, and so I am trying very, very diligently to visit the House and Senate membership while they are in district so that when they come to Raleigh, uh, it, we've already established that relationship. And I can articulate what it is that we need to be doing. Um, I'm just delighted to be here. I have uh, great uh, respect for what has happened. Uh, I believe that uh, we certainly uh, need to strive for excellence and always function in an environment of accountability, and that is what we call for me. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna really switch gears here with you, Jim. Um, it's been mentioned the Every Student Succeeds Act, which of course, I would hold that child left behind, giving flexibility back to the states, and, and what can be done um, to continue to improve education systems. How are you envisioning the new accountability system that Andrew had mentioned this morning as well, uh, that will be designed under ESSA to help inform educators, parents, policymakers about how well schools and districts are actually performing. ESSA gives North Carolina an opportunity to move beyond just test scores to determine how well our schools are doing. And we have solicited feedback from over 
I should say overviews, listed feedback from 99 different organizations about what sh how do we want to hold our schools accountable. And uh, it's easier at the high school level compared to uh, middle school and elementary school. And some of the ideas floating now, that we're still in a gathering of information stage. But some of the ideas for high school include, of course, graduation rate, the fourth and the fifth year, um, the readiness of students for work and for college, and that would include the percent of students who have, um, who have received uh, college credit while still in high school with to the community college system or advanced placement. Another idea is the remediation rate of our students at the high school, I mean, at the community college and the university level. Others have included such ideas as chronic absenteeism, uh, school climate as measured by parental and student involvement. Uh, but in the end, uh, I've been working very closely with my colleagues and superintendents who have a vested interest in making sure that we get this right. Um, I anticipate that we will identify anywhere from six to eight measures at the high school level, and that we will have that as the accountability, but we will also have a dashboard of different items that would help, that would give the public an idea of where we are with some processes. And so that's what I see at the high school level. Of course, we will have to do a lot of work with the General Assembly because just by virtue of the definitions in ESSA, the A through F accountability system passed by the General Assembly is out of alignment with what is required at the federal level. So we could have a federal accountability system and a state accountability system. And so there are advantages and disadvantages of that, but we we'll, uh, want to work and are working closely with some members of the General Assembly to see if we can have that aligned system. What's really critical is that we hear from business people, we hear from parents and, and associations about how do you want your schools to be measured? What is important to you? And you have the opportunity, I see lots of superintendents in here. Uh, if you are from a school district such as Surrey County or Stokes County or Alamance County, uh, give your feedback to your superintendent because they will be very integral in helping to make the recommendations that will come to the State Board of Education. And our goal is to have something um, as a draft uh, in the fall of the year. And we have to submit to the U.S. Department of Education either in March or in July what our proposal will be. But here is an opportunity for us to go beyond just test scores to determine how well our schools are doing. Peter, uh, we could come back to you and, and some of the other panelists got kind of the question about the vision for the future and taking a long view here with everything that's been talked about. If you could talk a little bit about your vision, the vision of President Spelling about uh, the UNC system and how it can adapt itself to better help students enter into an increasingly competitive global economy. Sure. Well, our, our mission is world-class teaching, research, public service uh, to create and discover and transmit and apply knowledge for the, the benefit of and address the needs of both individuals and society. And along that vein, uh, we have begun the process of updating our system's st strategic plan to reflect the realities of the world that we're living in. President Spellings has outlined five broad themes. Uh, the first being uh, the goal of access. Uh, we know we need to educate a broader swath of our population uh, and help more people achieve at higher levels. Secondly, uh, affordability and efficiency. Uh, we have to use our tax dollars and tuition proceeds very carefully and wisely so that we minimize any barriers to access that come as a result of cost. Third, student success. Have to ensure that there is value added uh, to every student's experience, 
while they're studying at one of our institutions. And we must especially support students of color, first generation students, and uh, those from low income families. Help them with the, the support that they need to succeed. Uh, fourth, excellent and diverse institutions. This is a great strength uh, in our system, the diversity of missions and population served in geographic regions that where we're located. Um, I think that uh, our challenge is to uh, make sure that we can create centers of excellence at each institution and avoid duplication, not try to be all things to all people at all institutions, but have some great programs at each school that are really signature efforts. Uh, finally, uh, ec the economic impact of the university system. If you include the healthcare system, all in, the university is a $10 billion a year enterprise. About a quarter of that uh, is state support. Uh, but it has uh, quite an effect on the entire state. And uh, as we consider how we prepare students as citizens and for careers and how we commercialize innovation, how we, we maximize the economic impact of the university is very important in North Carolina. So President Spelling has established this framework for uh, each of our institutions to uh, have input uh, into the plan, uh, decide uh, the measurements by which we will uh, hold them accountable for the results, uh, reward performance along the way, uh, and trust the good leaders that we have in place uh, and try to get out of their way uh, while they do work on these important questions. Thank you. Um, Jimmy, let me add along those same lines too in thinking about a global competitive economy. Uh, tell us what steps the community colleges are taking to help students and, and talk a little bit as well about what you mentioned of uh, dealing with kids who still need remedial coursework um, and need to understand how they can truly progress toward a successful uh, career when they leave your institutions. Right. Well, um, we have worked collaboratively with um, DPI and have made have seen some great strides in our, our remediation uh, levels and, and what we're required to, uh, to teach uh, at the community college level. We certainly are now using multiple measures for admission. We're not using one single test score to determine whether or not a student needs remediation. We're using the high school GPA, for example. It's a great predictor of how that student might, might um, uh, uh, be able to, to be successful in follow-on courses at the post-secondary level. Um, we are, we've reworked all of our remedial and developmental uh, education courses. Um, we are now uh, able to place a student where they need to be in a much more efficient way, in a modular-based way, rather than just dropping them into uh, a three-semester hour traditional course. We're able to give them the pieces that they truly need to be successful and to move through that process as quickly as possible. You know, it's sort of a conundrum, though, in terms of, of remedial education in the community college sector. We will never fully get away from that because we have so many students that stay out of higher education for so long and come back and need to uh, brush up on their math skills or their, their reading skills. So we will always have some level of remediation uh, in our system. But we are, we are encouraging much more uh, in terms of um, having our advisors be intrusive, uh, making sure that if someone is not showing up for class, that we are on the phone or we are texting or we are emailing that particular student and finding out what life experience is keeping them from being in the classroom or being on task as it relates to, to remedial education. And certainly um, more work-based learning helps because when a student can truly see that they are going to be able to apply a, a skill set they're learning in a course into the world of work, that is truly invaluable. And so um, as, as, we, uh, as we talk about this comprehensive remedial program, being able to show the application of what they're learning is of critical importance. Thank you. Um, we are now about uh, 13, 14 minutes left in our time here and wanted to open it up to questions that you all might have out there. 
take the opportunity. I think we've got a microphone headed the way. Back, let's start back here and then we'll move forward to you. Good morning. Thank you for uh, taking my question. Uh, one of the points you have not addressed that I'm very interested in is your views on early childhood education and then it's that continuum that you that was mentioned earlier, how all that fits together and how you all feel about the efficacy and the uh, uh, what role the government should play in, in early childhood education. Representative Corn, thank you for being here. <laughs> I can count on you to do that. Uh, who, who would like to take this one first? In order for us to have high achieving students, and in order for us to have high growth, we need preschool experiences for quality preschool experiences especially for our most vulnerable children who do not have the opportunity to have preschool. Um, for every dollar we invest in preschool, we see a return on that investment, and that would vary from the economists determining what is the return on investment. We also know from our own third-party evaluators when preschool education was a part of the Department of Public Instruction that we see uh, gaps closing between our children who live in poverty, who may have English as a second language compared to other students uh, in the school. I believe that one of the best investments North Carolina can make is to ensure that students, especially our most vulnerable children, have access to quality preschool education. And both words are very important, quality preschool. I'd just say very briefly, uh, thank you, Representative Horn, for all you do for us uh, in the legislature and uh, as a leader on so many education issues. The, the university system plays a, a role uh, in this issue in a, in a variety of ways, but just one that I'd like to spotlight uh, that I think we can help decision makers uh, is identifying the most effective practices uh, in early childhood education because, as you know, uh, it seems like such a commonsensical idea, of course, uh, but the data have shown a variety of outcomes in early childhood education. Uh, and we want to help find the most effective practices because, as Dr. Atkinson said, uh, it can really make a difference in, in the lives of those young people. Uh, they've got a level playing field uh, to start from the beginning. So we want to be your partner uh, in that effort. Certainly the community colleges play a role in um, following up with what Dr. Atkinson mentioned about quality uh, preschool education in our um, child growth and development programs and, and early childhood education, um, being able to put those, those qualified um, and highly skilled um, preschool teachers and daycare workers out there and be able to um, so that you don't just have someone who is taking care of a child just to take care of a child, but it's truly a learning experience in preparation for uh, a P-12 experience. Thank you. I think we have a question up here. Uh, hi, um, I'm a high school biology teacher, um, so this is coming from my perspective. It's specific. Um, but uh, I know that North Carolina worked with a bunch of other states to help develop the next generation science units, uh, which are in incorporating um, the problem solving and the critical thinking skills that we've been talking about today that businesses are looking for. Um, so what discussions have there been about formally adopting those standards? And is there um, discussion at the community college and college level about training teachers in using those standards your well, I'm sure that there are discussions that I'm not yet aware of since I've only been on the job for six weeks, but I know <laughs> that our chief instructional officers are aligned with what uh, K-12 is trying to, uh, to do in terms of those standards. So uh, if we have not um, signed on, we will. <laughs> the 
State Board of Education policy is that we review our standards once every five years or before that, uh, if necessary. Uh, and science is getting to that point. Uh, North Carolina was very involved in the development of those standards. And because of many reasons, we continued with the standards that had already been adopted. I do believe that we see great promise in the states having adopted those standards and there's much to be learned uh, and to be used in North Carolina. Having said that, uh, there are parallels in our standards now to make sure that we have problem solving, problem based learning, project based learning. So I would encourage you to uh, apply the pressure as a science teacher, a biology teacher, to move us as we go forward with the next generation um, standards in math, I mean, in science. And I also have to add, uh, it has been a struggle and we appreciate the support, again, of the Chamber and other business people saying that you need higher standards. And without that support, I believe that North Carolina may have gone to a place where we had lower standards. And we don't want that to happen. Of course, science is extremely important to uh, the workplace. So uh, that time is coming to review those standards and we appreciate being in place we move forward. We're certainly supportive of higher standards and aligning uh, them between our respective systems. I'd like to get your contact information if I could, please, because uh, I can answer your questions uh, more adequately with a little bit of help from folks that know more about that topic. Additional questions here? Yeah. This question is uh, primarily for uh, Dr. Williams and then Dr. Agnes, and you probably asked them as well. Um, as a small, I'm a small business owner here, we're drawing on a couple of businesses. Uh, one I primarily run is advanced manufacturing company, CNC machine, machines, well, engineers. And my question is, and it may be a little early in your current position to answer regards to North Carolina, but maybe in your previous position. What do we do from the community college perspective to promote success stories of community college graduates? Because, you know, I said a lot of these conferences, a lot of meetings, most of the speakers are have master's degrees, master's degrees, and even doctorates. So, you know, from that perspective, encouraging the young people that aren't on that course for a four-year program. And the parents, you know, broaden that interest gap. We talk about skills gap. I uh, also said on Board of Development Board, Central Line Board of Development Board. And I think one of the things we see along with the skills gap is an interest gap. So we've gone back to the junior high level, uh, seventh and eighth graders. I had under 10 eighth graders to my facility last summer, and I was pretty amazed at, at what we do. And you know, the average pay for most of my employees is well over the national average. And some can make considerably higher than that. So my question is, what have you done maybe in the past, or what could we do? And I have some thoughts on that. I'd like to speak with you, maybe on side. Absolutely, we could we could spend another hour talking about sure. this. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You know the the, the skills that that um, he's talking about in, in advanced manufacturing uh, that is uh, systemic nationwide. It's not just um, true in North Carolina. We found that in South Carolina as well. Um, getting those parents to understand that it is acceptable and and really it is a worthy profession for their son or daughter to be involved in is, is something that is very, very important. We've talked a lot in the first six weeks about a, a branding initiative uh, throughout the state of North Carolina, which is something that I was involved in in South Carolina, to really talk about that value. You know, one of the things that we found in, in South Carolina was that we were doing a good job of producing those graduates. We just need to do more. We need more of those graduates. Uh, they have the skills. They're successful when they get out. We just need to uh, increase that pipeline. Parents and guidance counselors are a key component in that so that they understand. If you, I've not had a lot of chance to visit uh, many industries in North Carolina, although that's on the list, and I'm trying to do that as I make my way through the state. But in South Carolina, I would venture to say, if you walk through the production facility at Boeing, 
The floor at Boeing, the construction floor, is cleaner than your kitchen floor. It is mine. And that is the kind of environment, it's a high-tech, high-skilled, and high-pay, high-reward environment that we need to explain to the parents that this is not your father's manufacturing, your grandfather's manufacturing. Um, it is very, very high skill and very technology-based. Um, and so, you know, we, we put together several programs in, in South Carolina that were successful. I hope to replicate some of those here. Uh, I am a huge, huge component of, of, or proponent of um, apprenticeships. Uh, I had the, the, um, the good fortune and the luck to be able to develop the first healthcare related apprenticeship in the state of South Carolina. We can do that here in North Carolina. We can grow that apprenticeship program to uh, a level that, um, that we, we just can't imagine at, at this point, but it will help in a long way, go a long way in solving that skills gap. Uh, just quickly, because I know we're running out of time. Uh, we have developed uh, what is called home base, and it's a technology infrastructure and as a part of that infrastructure is a parent portal. So we have the potential to reach the parents of 1.6 million children through home base. And uh, as an idea, we could certainly add to that parent portal, uh, so what about a career for your child? And, and in that portal, we can include lots of videos to publicize the success, and that's where we would need the support of business and industry to make sure that we have quality videos or YouTubes uh, where our parents could see the many opportunities. And also that would give an opportunity for students to see. Uh, we also need to continue to look at the middle school level, that's really important, with students at work, and with our career exploration type courses. Our teachers are always looking for materials to use or uh, for, and when I say materials, I'm talking about digital also. So that's also another opportunity. That was a great question, uh, and I just want to say, Jimmy, I know June and I both are really glad to have you on the right side of the Carolina border. <laughs> You're going to be a great partner for all of us. Thank you. We've got time for one last question. Here. <laughs> okay. I'm also a teacher, like um, and. I think it's awesome that 35% of students who graduated in 2015 had college credit coming into wherever they were going. I think that's absolutely incredible. But I kind of am sitting here wondering if that's actually because they're capable of doing college work and they're actually ready for college, or if it's just because students are good test takers. Um, because to me, what I see with my kids is that just because they're a good test taker doesn't automatically mean they're good at other things that are important to be a successful human being, like group work or communicating effectively. So like, I'm just kind of curious about um, ways that we can actually look at maybe soft skills or like actually really determining whether or not a child is college or career ready instead of just uh, the statistic of 35% uh, percent reflects the grade that the student got in a course. So the answer to your question depends on the teacher at the community college level or at the university level or at advanced placement teacher as to whether they included more than just tests in determining whether that student was, uh, received a passing grade. Uh, it is really important as we look toward the future, that we not only look at content, but we also look at character building. And that's very important. And of course, that's much more difficult to measure, but that's something that we have to focus as a part of our work as teachers in the public schools. And I think with that, we are out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. <laughs>